love it. Hey, I want to welcome you all to, to, to church. Amen? Hey, welcome. Yes, welcome to Mana. All of our guests online, Facebook, all you people, welcome. I know a lot of my family's watching, so um, not because I'm here, because they watch every Sunday. So praise God for that. Um, I'm Vince. I'm one of the pastors here on, at, at Mana. I serve underneath Tom, and it is an honor to serve uh, Mana Church and underneath his leadership. Last week, Pastor Tom started off, uh, opened up a series called Running with the Giants. We're talking about uh, these these giants of people, these people who may not seem like giants at the time, but we're pulling character uh, qualities and some of their failures out of their life so we can apply them to our life today and see what maybe some obstacles we can avoid or what some avenues that we can approach uh, to make our lives uh, a little easier, if you will, right? Uh, last week he covered Mary, Jesus' mom, and he was talking about um, the, the facing life's impossibilities. Today we're going to dive into the life of Jacob. We're going all the way back to Genesis. But before I do that, I do want to pray. Uh, but I want to pray over Tom and Julie, who are on sabbatical. Uh, sabbatical is just a time of rest and relaxation. It's not vacation for them. This is a time where they're pursuing uh, oneness in their marriage. They're pursuing oneness in God. He's getting visions and downloads from God to find out what we're going to be doing in the coming year. So it really impacts us as a family, even our online people. You're part of this family. Uh, we want you to join us in prayer as we pray over Tom and Julie so that they can come back refreshed physically, mentally, spiritually, and we can, you know, we can really hit the road running when they come back. Amen? Plus, we want them to have good traveling mercies and fun while they're there. It's part of the whole experience. So join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for, uh, for who you are, and we love you so much. We love you so much. We love what you're doing in our community and in this church. And Father, I just pray right now over Tom and Julie as they're getting refreshed mentally, physically, spiritually. Father, they're just finding joy in what they're doing. They're finding joy in each other. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen their marriage as they're away and they're just enjoying each other. Lord, I pray they would their, 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 their relationship with you is being strengthened individually and as a couple. Lord, refresh them from the inside out. Let them experience a whole other level of joy in this season in their life. Oh Lord, calm their anxious hearts. Show up in a way that just says to them that you love them in a mighty way. Lord, be with us in this service. Lord, let my words be heard, but let your voice be what is uh, contended with in each heart and in each mind. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, like I said, today we're, we're diving into Jacob, uh, the life of Jacob. Um, I, want to, I want to set a little bit of a stage of who Jacob is. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking more about these characters. Uh, we have a bunch of characters coming in to talk about the characters. Okay? Um, I know that was, they're not really characters. They're good people. Um, one of Dave Poindexter is going to be up here speaking. We have uh, the Sanchez family coming. We've got a bunch of them coming uh, just to give you guys a little variety of people that uh, can present these, these characters. So uh, tell your friends, tell your families, come on back, and we'll see a new character each week. <coughs> So we're talking about Jacob. Jacob is the grandson. He's the grandson to Abraham, who you know from Genesis. Uh, Abraham's the one who God promised the, the nations to. He promised all these great things to him, and he went and had a son, Isaac. Uh, Abraham had to take him to the mountain and was going to kill him. And I'm just trying to give you a little historical background of who this lineage. So Isaac is the one who uh, married Rebekah, and then... They had twins, Jacob and Esau. Jacob is the younger of the twins, which confuses me of why we say Jacob and Esau and not Esau and Jacob, but each their own, right? So Jacob was a mama's boy, if I can use that term. He was a mama's boy. Between the two of them, Jacob was the one who stayed at home. He did the cooking and cleaning and all that fun stuff. You know, nothing wrong with that. I mean, we need those kind of guys. We need those people in our lives. Um, but in comparison to Esau, who's the one who was the hunter, the big burly guy, was always at the gym, you know, <coughs> man, <coughs> right? Um, that, that was Esau, the hunter, and Jacob was more of the home carer. Uh, Jacob is rightly named Jacob because he was a deceiver, a trickster, which is what his name actually means. And, you know, even, even coming out, uh, Esau's coming out, and Jacob reaches out and grabs his foot. <laughs> <laughs> he tries to pull him in, like, no, I don't, no, I want to come first. It's like he's got this thing in his head where he's not really happy, and we're going to see some of that coming along. 
uh, going on through his life. Jacob's at home, and he's making dinner, and he's got some great soup. There's probably Dinny Moore beef stew. You know, it's one of my favorites, especially when it's raining. You know, he's making Dinny Moore beef stew, and Esau comes in, didn't have a real good day of hunting, and he says, hey, give me some of that food. And Jacob says, well, give me your birthright. He's like, what? Now, first off, in my mind, in my 21st century brain, I'm thinking, if you're this big, bad hunter dude, why didn't you just take the soup? Why did you give up your birthright? So I don't really blame Jacob too much for this one, right? I mean, if you're, all right, anyways. Um, yeah, I mean, but anyways, Esau says, okay, take my birthright, give me the soup. So he eats. I'm sure he was, had remorse afterwards. Um, Jacob goes on to deceive his father. He goes on to deceive his father. His father was half blind or really blind, and his mother helped him get all dressed up like Esau, big, burly, hairy guy, and went in and stole Esau's birthright, or his, uh, stole his blessing. So he leaves, and Esau shows up and says, Hey, Dad, I'm here. I'm ready to get my blessing. He's like, Well, I just gave you your blessing. He says, No, you didn't. I just got back. How did you give it to me? Your brother Jacob, rightly named the deceiver, has took it from you. And so now there's this big riff, right? Big family. We all know about family riffs. Nothing new. They've been happening since the beginning of time, obviously. So anyway, so now Jacob uh, is fearing for about Esau. Esau is about to rip this guy uh, in half. So his mom tells him to take off. And Jacob takes off and to his uncle, Laban. He wants to marry one girl. He gets tricked into another girl. The whole story goes on. There's this big, huge riff. And this is where we pick the story up. You all got your story 101 of Jacob in for the day, all right? And you're like, well, how does this all apply to me? And we're going to look into it. So from Jacob's life, I want to show you, and I want to encourage you, and I want to challenge you all in the same time on what to do when your life isn't turning out the way you had hoped. Anybody else feel like that sometimes? It's like, man, I got this great plan for my life, and it did not look like where I am right now. That is for sure. I can tell you when I got out of high school, I was like, nope. Nope, I'm, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to be doing, but I, did, I can look back at my 18-year-old self and say, this is not where I thought I would be. <laughs> that is for true uh, right there. And I know my family's watching. They're like, yeah, it shocked us too. We're <laughs> I'm sure of it. So anyways, let's go to our key verse. This is the key verse for this whole uh, series. It comes from Hebrews 12.1. And it says, Therefore, we, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with the endurance, the race that God has set before us. And there's like at least seven sermons in this verse alone. So I'm, I did really good in just focusing on one little piece of this uh, for you. And I want to exp- just focus in on let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Sometimes we can, when we read the Bible, we'll just blow through pieces of the Bible are like, okay, I understand that. But I really want to focus in on this for a second. Every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. When we, when we first have to go back and define sin, sin is anything that separates us from God. Right? God can't be in sin. He can't acknowledge sin. He can't, he can't be in the same room as darkness because he is light. Let me put it that way. So what is the sin we're talking about? Here, and you're going to see this as we're going uh, through this, the weight that we're doing, the sin that we have, is trying to do things our own way. Anybody ever try that? Yeah, God, you got a great plan for me, but I want to do this instead. Come on, I know I'm not the only person, right? Yeah. So no, Lord, that sounds like a great plan. And I'm sure in your world it works, but for me, I like this over here better. And then we end up getting ourselves into into a crisis, if you will. Some of you here today... Um, are trying to write or re-script or reprogram your life. I'm, I, I turned this into a technology thing because I think that's the kind of world we're in. So I've kind of used this analogy of reprogramming ourselves with a, or we're having a bad program in our bodies, okay? So we're here today. Some of you are here today and you're trying to write the script of your life, a life that's already scripted for you and you're trying to overwrite it. Does that make sense? You're trying to, there's a program in me and now as I'm going through life, I'm trying to build in another program, and they're not compatible. It's like taking a PC and a Mac and trying to make them work. It doesn't work, okay? Thank you, Lord, for that analogy that just came to me. Okay, you're, you're ignoring what's, what we call the, the, your calling, this, this thing in your gut, in your knower, 
You know there's something in you that you know that you're supposed to be doing. It's something that you're good at. You know this is what God has called me to do, and you just can't get away from it. I was in college, and I'm going through, uh, through all my, my Bible courses, and I got frustrated. I'm like, this is just not, I can't write, I can't do this. It was all the I can'ts, right? The, they have cousins. I can't write, I can't read, I can't do this. They're all cousins, and none of them are do any good for you, okay? So I said, forget this. I'm going to be an accountant. I love numbers. I love spreadsheets. I'm going to be an accountant. Uh, it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> I got through the first course, and my brain just fell apart. I'm like, never mind. I'm going back to theology. It's a little easier, I think. It didn't work. My gut, I, I couldn't get away from what God had called me to, to be. He, I couldn't get away from, uh, even when if I, even my, in my studies, I got away from it. God put people in my life where I kept ministering to. I'm like, okay, I guess this is just what it is. The calling of God is not convoluted. It's not shaded somewhere. It's not a scratch-off ticket that you have, to, you have to figure out. It's always ever-present in front of you. He is always ever-present in front of you, and you just ask him, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? It's that gut feeling, that gut thing you know. It's the only way I know how to say it. People ask me, well, how do I know what my calling is? You'll be good at it. It comes natural, and it's always in your face, and you can't get away from it if you wanted to. It's just what it is. And that's between you and God. Go to God and ask him. He will make it apparent to you, okay? And be, because of this, because of this rewriting and the scripting that you're trying to do in your life, you always find yourself in a crisis. That was me. I was in a crisis. I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to do Bible class. I thought I was doing the right thing, right? And then, then I'm, I said, no, I'm going to become an accountant. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to be an accountant. And then I just my whole life just went into chaos, it's like, that is not, you're on the wrong track, going in the wrong place. Get off that road. Get back to where you're supposed to be. But it doesn't make sense. God says, don't worry about it making sense. Just be obedient. That was the biggest lesson I learned. Just be obedient. Let me tell you something about crisis. Some people say, well, you know, crisis is just part of life. You know, God does not create the crisis. God does not create the crisis, but he allows the crisis to happen. That's just the way it is. It's, it's how he is. It's, it's who he is. You don't, some lessons you learn by watching people. Some lessons you learn by going through the crisis. And you'll know, ooh, I cannot do that again. Because it leads to two types of guilt. You get the good guilt, which is the Holy Spirit saying, hey, Vince, Hey, knucklehead, remember you've been here before? This smells like something, looks like something you ain't supposed to be doing? That's good English, ain't? I've been in the South too long. <laughs> yeah. I hear my mom now. You know ain't ain't a word? Yes, ma'am. Um, but anyway, you know, so, so anyways, that's that. But then you got the, the bad guilt, which is the guilt you bring upon yourself and you keep yourself hunkered down. That's not the good guilt. The good guilt is the Holy Spirit saying, hey, knucklehead, don't do this. You've been here before. So here's the million-dollar question, and I appreciate you asking. Um, I know somebody has this question. Well, Vince, that's great. i got crisis in my life. I don't know what my, my calling is. How do I limit the crisis in my life? Because that's what we really want, right? We don't want all these crises in our life, so how do we limit it? And here's, I want to give you the big idea. It's on your notes. If you don't have notes, raise your hand. Somebody will get them to you. Uh, if you don't, They're online if you guys want them. I'm sure they're there because Riley does such a great job. Here's the big idea. You want to avoid crisis in your life as much as possible let god have control of your life i knew it vince there was a trick you tricked me is it really that simple yes it is if you have a dvd player do we still have those dvd players if you have a tv everybody got a tv right you got a tv you got it from vizio I'm, i don't know what's better or not that's just one i have at home right it's got a vizio something goes wrong I bought it at Walmart. Do I take it back to Walmart? No, they're just a reseller. But if I go back to Vizio and I find the manufacturer's number and I go back to the person and the line that they made it and I go back to the person who put it together, he's the actual manufacturer, right? He could tell me exactly what's wrong with the TV. So why would we do that with our life? When, when if, if, if you're going to give God control of your life, and you say, all right, God, take control of my life, that means no matter what happens, you can always go to him because he is the manufacturer of you. He knows you from the inside out. He says he, puts you, he knits you together in your mother's womb. 
He knows your DNA. He knows your programming. He, he sets your path. Does that make sense? So why would we not give him control? That's just an, another question. But I'm going to pose to you three ideas that Jacob gives us. And we're going to look at Jacob, a part of Jacob's life. I want to give you three ideas, um, three things, three benefits that you'll get from giving God full control of your life. Notice the key word here. Giving God control of your life is one thing. Giving God full control is another. Because I'm know i so, I'm, I'm being honest with you. There's some things in my life that are like, all right, God, here you go. No, not this, though. I'll hang on to that. I don't know if I quite trust you with this one just yet. It's kind of sensitive. It's kind of... No, you've got to give him control of everything. Remember the verse... Love, your, lo love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. That means love God with everything you have. Because nothing belongs to you in the first place. Your life doesn't even belong to you. You can see that here. Anyways, the first thing we have, first thing we'll look at is that you're going to get a new strength. Somebody just want to, you want to wake up in the morning and just be like, oh, I feel so good. I feel empowered. I feel strong. We're going to see this. You're going to get a new strength. Let God have full control of your life, and you'll get a new strength. Turn to Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible, chapter 32, verse 24 and 25. I'm reading from the NLT, and we're looking at Jacob's life. And I already told you that he, he, he ran to Laban. He married a couple wives, and, and then he's got all these family, and he's, he's, he's going back to another city. He's got all this family with him. His father-in-law chased after him and, you know, uh, tried to holler at him for, for stealing his gods, and Jacob's like, I don't have anything. He didn't steal them. Uh, one of his wives did, but he didn't know that at the time. And So finally he gets word that Esau is coming at him. And Esau is a very powerful man, a very powerful person. So, he's, so Jacob gets this great idea. He says, okay, uh, team A, you, go that way. Team B, half of you, go that way. Remember, this is the VIV, Vince Interpreted Version, for illustration purposes. No animals were hurt during this making okay so just follow along so anyways he takes half his family and they go that way he takes half the family and goes that way and this is where we pick up this verse in verse 24 he says this left jacob all alone in the camp a man came and wrestled with him a man an angel god uh a theophany we call it um that's that's what this is a man came and wrestled with him until dawn began to break when the man saw he would not win the match he touched jacob's hip and wrenched out of a socket. There are some of you here today that are wrestling with God. I'm going to give you the most theological, practical advice a pastor could ever give somebody that's wrestling with God. You don't even have to write this down. Stop. There, that's your money's worth right there, right? <laughs> Stop. You can't win. You will not win. You can wrestle with God or you can learn from those who have. We want to learn from Jacob, right? Let's learn from Jacob. God doesn't care how strong you are. God, I go to the gym three times a day. I bench press 450. God's like, great, great. Immediately when I was putting this together, I was thinking of Samson, right? Samson's strength came from God. Not his hair, but from God, right? We just we have it in that, in that story. God can give you your strength he can take away when you come when push comes to shove god will always win i'm telling you you're looking at a man who wrestled with god i wrestled with god said no god, i am not doing ministry god said <laughs> you're so funny you see who won right i let him off with a warning <laughs> yeah you see god shows his strength god shows by popping jacob's hip out of socket i think this was a reminder this is like an a a, a a reminder for all of us. God says this is not Burger King. You can't have it your way right away. God says I am the king. And I will get it my way. I will have it my way. Don't forget. This is God saying don't forget who made you. I am stronger. I created you. I knew you before you even were thought of. I knew you. I ordained your steps. I loved you. Wow, really? Man. You know the phrase we say here, right? God made you on purpose, and he made you for a purpose. Yes. 
And it wasn't to wrestle with God. God didn't say, you know what, Ziggy, I'm going to make you, and I want you to wrestle with me your entire life. That would just wear you out. It would wear you out. Matter of fact, God, God's design for you is not to wear you out. Look what Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and 29. Jesus said, come to all me, all of you who are weary, carry heavy, heavy burdens, I will give you rest. Pause. This does not mean sleep during the sermon. Matter of fact, we're going to have people walking around with water bottles to spray you as you, no, uh, kidding, sort of. This does not mean sleep, though. It doesn't. I mean, yes, if you need sleep, you know, we pray for Tom and Julie. They're, they're out there. I hope they get some sweet sleep. I hope they, when they lay down and they go to sleep, that the rest is just tenfold in their body, in their mind. But we're talking about an everyday, daily walk with God. This is not, this is not what this means. Because the very next piece of this verse says, Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Wait a minute, time out. You just told me to rest. Now you want me to pick up this yoke and walk. Which one do you want me to do? Now let's talk about this thing about a yoke. A yoke is not the thing in an egg. That's a different spelling, right? Which would be, you know, you don't want that. A yoke is something that goes over the top of an oxen, an oxen, or a, 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 yeah, an oxen, and there's another piece that goes underneath them, and it, they walk. And it keeps, it was the first OCD person that came up with this. I think they were making spreadsheet in the, in the dirt, right? So they put two oxen together and they put the yokes over the top and it keeps them together so they can walk down and make one complete straight line, right? So the, and the, 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 there's two types of yokes. You got the one that was just off the shelf, great value. You go over there, you buy it, you slap it on your animal and you say, go. And what it ends up doing is it ends up cutting ends up cutting and it wears on the animal. What's, what, what do you think the shelf life of that animal is going to be? It's not going to it's not going to work as long. It's not going to work as hard. It's going to have a longer recovery time. It's burdensome. Then you got the other guys who really love their animals and they go out and they they measure their animals and they go to, you know, they go to uh, Armani and they get a they get a, a yoke finished. I mean, fixed right to them, right? They said, "Man, this is going to fit you perfect." It's cut in all the right places. It fits on them. It's just perfect. And that oxen walks around like, yeah, I got this. I got this. And just pull it. I could do this all day. Two types of yoke. Jesus' yoke, the one he puts on us, is custom fit for us. Custom fit. He goes on to say, let me teach you because I am humble. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I am humble. I am gentle at heart. You will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. The yoke I give you is custom fit for your life. Yes, you're going to go through, you might hit a rock, you might get a little hard dirt, but you're going to blow right through it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Have you ever heard this phrase? Jesus will never give you more than you can handle. I don't know why we have to say it in a southern accent, because we're in the south, I guess. Jesus never give you more than you can handle. Wrong. How about, we re, how about we restate that? Right? Let's restate it. Let's say Jesus will, ne- Jesus will be with you with everything he gives you to handle. Does that sound better? That sounds a little more theologically sound, right? Jesus will never give you more than you can handle. Th- I don't see that. I, I'm looking at the apostles. I'm looking at John, who was boiled in oil, who was who was uh, you know, beat to death, he was, well, not to death, but he was beat, and then he was cast out. That's, that's a little more than I can handle, okay? But how about Jesus will always be with you with everything he gives you to handle if you give him control of your life. This idea of the yoke, I love it that Jesus uses it because it gives me this impression, it gives me this idea that the yoke has got two holes in it. So I have one yoke on. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. I got a yoke on. Who's in the other yoke? If there's nobody in it, I'm so that's a, there's a crisis in my life. I'm never going to get anywhere. I'm just going in circles because it's not going to go anywhere. But what if, what if we partner with Jesus? We said, Jesus, I need you to be in this other yoke. I need you to be here. I'm going to give you the control. You just guide me and I'll go. Do you think we'll, we'll get more done that way? I know I would. Okay, let's move on. The second thing will happen when you give God control of your life is not only will you get, uh, uh, um, man, 
new strength. That's what it was. I almost went into the third point. Can't do that. Um, you'll get a new identity. A new identity. Actually, that's not even a true statement. That's not a true statement because you, you, you're going to get a polished identity because your identity has always been with you. When God created you, He created you to be who you are. He uploaded, uh, you know, he uploaded Vince 1.0, and that was perfect for this operating system. It's perfect. But no, I have to go in, i got to upload, you know, I'm up to Vince 4.9. All right? And it's like, it doesn't work. God's like, no, give me control, and, I'll, and I will format your hard drive, and I will, uproot, I will, I will boot back up 1.0, the one that's perfectly made for you. No upgrades are needed. I guarantee it will work. It's not, your, it's not a new identity, but your original identity. It gets rid of the glitches. It gets rid of the bugs, the crashing, the crisis. It's been perfectly coded for you. Look at Genesis 32, continuing on with our verses 27 and 28. What is your name? This man, this, you know, God asked Jacob. He says, what is your name? And Jacob replied, my name is Jacob. And God, this is important because God will make you face. He'll make you come face to face with the things that you've, you've recoded, okay? So it's like he's come making you come to face to face, and it makes the next statement even more powerful because he says, your name will no longer be Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob. From now on, you will be called Israel. Because you have fought with God and with men, and you have won. Did you catch that? His name is Jacob. He says, I've been identified as Jacob, the deceiver, the trickster, since the moment I've been born. And God says, no, your name does not identify you. People, I'm here to tell you that the addictions that you have do not identify you. Your failures from your past do not identify you. Nothing that you do identifies you except your identity in Christ. Give him control of your life. God does not see you as you are. Praise God. He does not see you as you are, but he sees you as what you could become. He believes more for you than you believe for yourself. This has been my life phrase forever because I've had people pour into my life. Vince, I know there's more in you than what you have. I know you can do more. I know you can do better. And so well, apparently you don't know me. Well, apparently they did. <laughs> I can only speak of my own life. This is how much this, this means to me. You see, God doesn't see actualities. Well, actually, God, I'm, I'm addicted to this. Or actually, God, I'm, I'm just a deadbeat dad. Or actually, Dad, I'm the worst. Or uh, I'm, actually, God, I'm just a, a, a horrible husband. I have failed so many times. He's like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. See, God doesn't see you in actualities. He sees your possibilities. He says, yes, Vince, but the possibilities of you being able to reach other men and show them how to live a godly life, I see that. I see how you've broken this addiction in your life, and now I know you can speak into people's lives. You have passion and compassion for people and for ministry, and I see that. And that's what I want to hone in on. Give me control of your life. I'm all yours, God. I surrender all. <laughs> God doesn't see actualities. He sees possibilities now i can't i can't speak to many truths in the bible in my own personal life but i can speak to this one i promise you if you looked at my life you know, I always tell people if i could play my life out on a screen you'd been like call the elders this guy should not be on stage this guy should not even be speaking but praise god he sees me for who i can possibly be not for who i actually am or actually was i should say so we saw Jacob the deceiver recoded, a new program uploaded, it, and he went from the deceiver to Israel. Y'all know what Israel means? Prince of God. So God has a new name for you. Isn't that cool? When, when you're walking in with God and he says, Vince, I don't want you to be Vince. I want you to be my prince. I want you to be my favorite kid. I want you to walk with your head up like, I'm going to bless you wherever you go. We're going to talk about that in a minute, too. We're going to look at another guy, too. Real quick, John 1, uh, you know, John, uh, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, 
uh, verse 42. Then Andrew, who is already a disciple of Jesus, right? I can just see him. Remember VIV? We're going back to that, right? He runs home. Simon, you got to come check this dude out. He's doing miracles. He teaches like nobody else. He's like convincing him, you got to come see him. Simon's like, all right, whatever. Puts down his whittling and gets up, and Simon brings him to meet Jesus. And I love this because it says, looking intently at Simon. So this is Jesus. Hmm. Looking intently at him, right? Your name is Simon, son of John. But you will be called Cephas. Why is this so big? You know what Cephas translates to as Peter, right? Simon, in the translation, means a listener. He's just a listener, not a doer. He just sits around and listens. Not a bad thing, but that's not what Jesus needs. Jesus needs some doers. So he upgrades them from listener to rock. And on this rock, Jesus tells them he's going to do what? He's going to build his church. So you're going from being a listener to being the very foundation of an organization that's going to advance the kingdom and usher into, and usher into the world this idea, this new covenant. <gasps> that's an upgrade. Do you know you have an upgrade waiting? I know I just said there's no upgrades, but God, God's upgrades are different. You can't upgrade yourself, okay? Don't be going out there looking for Vince 2.0, and it doesn't work, okay? When God gets ready to upgrade you, it's just, it's like a download content. It's a DLC. It's just going to download. It still sticks with you. I don't know if I have any gamers, but I tried to make it a little more relevant. I'm sorry. Anyways, when God's going to upgrade you, you can't, you can't avoid it. He's going to upgrade you. So he went from Simon the listener to the rock, the foundation. So my question is, what lies in store for you? What lies, what is lying in store for you? What is God saying? I can just picture God as a dad. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait for my son to get out of the, out of the army. And I was excited. And, or I can't wait for him to go in. And I can't wait for this stage of life. And I'm excited for my, my, my daughter to get married. She, you know, she was getting married. I'm like, I'm excited for these events. They don't have really any bearing on me, but... I'm excited for them. I can just picture God being the same way. Come on, Vince. I got you. You're going to get through this little thing, this little crisis, or whatever it is in your life that you're going through, because you've given me control. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to keep you, and I'm going to love you. Oh, thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. Right? What lies in store for you is your code needing to be reformatted. You need to take that back to God. Here's the third thing. Third thing that happens when you let God have full control of your life, you'll get new strength, you'll get your old identity back, really. You get a polished identity, and you'll get new joy. You're like, ah, oh, that's so nice. I did not say happiness, people. Do not confuse happiness with joy. They are not the same thing. Happiness is circumstantial. It comes from external events. You want to be happy? Go buy a toaster. Right? I mean, I, I, I love shopping. I'm the shopper. I love it when I go shopping. Get on Amazon, buy something. Oh, I get excited. I'm happy because I know sooner or later I'm going to get a package. It's almost like buyer's remorse afterwards. It's like, man, now I got it. I want to order something else. Yes, I, I've asked God to, to fix this problem I have, but um, it is what it is, right? Happiness comes from external avenues. Joy is not circumstantial. It comes from within. There's a great little analogy. As a matter of fact, my wife helped me come up with, found this for me. She says, this is really what this is. I'm like, okay, I love it. You ready? Happiness is like rising bubbles. It's delightful, but it's inevitably fleeting. Like little bubbles. You're happy for a moment. You're like, yes, but eventually it's like, oh, whatever. Joy, on the other hand, is like oxygen. It's ever-present. If you're a Christian and you believe Jesus Christ is your personal Savior and you know that God has full control of your life, you have this thing called joy. This joy that settles in you. So we're going to look at Genesis, uh, look, continue on with Jacob's story. So now it's Jacob's turn. So the man asked Jacob, what is your name? And then Jacob says, all right, great, now I'm Israel. So Jacob turns to him and says, well, tell me your name. And God says, why do you want to know my name? And it just kind of blows him off. He's like, dude, you can't handle all that I am. He replied to the man, he says, why do you want to know my name? Then he blessed Jacob there. 
God is literally saying, you can't handle who I am. Your little finite brain, is, it, can't, it can't possibly comprehend that I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am Jehovah Rapha. I am Jehovah Jireh. I am the great provider. I am the great healer. I am the creator of the heavens and the earth. I literally created you. Your brain can't handle all that I am. But he didn't say all that. He just said, why do you want to know my name? I'm just going to bless you. Just stop. I'm just going to bless you. Now, our ideas of blessing, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Blessing in our brains is misconstrued. We think blessing is money, items, houses, Maseratis, you know, all this. I got all this stuff. I'm so blessed. You know, you can have all that stuff and still have no joy and still not be blessed. Blessing, blessing, ready, is actually internal joy. Is internal joy. Because he can't take that from you. I've known people that have suffered immensely and yet still walk around with the joy. I'm like, I don't understand how you can do that. I would be so distraught because I'm looking at the, the situation from the outside. But their inside is like, well, I know who my creator is. I know he died for me. I know if, if I die, I win. <laughs> right? I mean, you know what? I mean, you stay alive, you win. Okay, I get to stay with my family. I die, I win. I get to be with God. They have so much joy. My mom used to say, and, and you know, she raised five of us. You, know, you guys have heard my story, and she raised five of us, and she would always say, find, not in so many words, but I can always remember this, this idea of, Finding, finding joy in just the small things. A family picnic, a walk out to the beach. You know, we go, Mom, why do we have to walk out? Because we didn't have a car. We, we walk all the way. We're like, you know, I went back as an, uh, as an adult. I'm like, wow, this is only like a mile. But as a kid, when your legs are this big, you know, it's like 12 miles. You're like, oh, my goodness, you know. And, and, my mom, and my mom's like, well, you know, just be thankful you can walk here. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, you know. Uh, you know, find that there's find your internal joy, which is God. When you have God, when He's control of your life, you have your crisis become not so crisis. Okay, you're gonna face things. You're gonna face the death of loved ones. You're gonna face um, uh, diseases. You're gonna face all these things that we call crisis. But when you have God and He's in control of your life, you can say, Lord, nothing that stands before me can hurt me. Matter of fact. Uh, Jesus goes on to say in his, in his Sermon on the Mount, and I talked about this in one of the other sermons I had, I named all 12 or 14 of them. He says, blessed are those, dot, 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 right? So Matthew 5, 6, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness or for justice, for they will be filled. May the joy of these people, the, the people will be uh, full of joy for those who, lo- who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The bottom line is give God control of your life and there's nothing the earth can do to you. You can't. There's nothing it can do to you. Father, I walk in your presence every day. You are my joy. I find you in the and I find joy in the very things that you tell me. It comes from within. So there's nothing that I'm going to walk into today that's going to bother me. That they can't, you can't harm me. Like I said, if they hurt you and you die, you, you win. You get to spend eternity with Jesus. That's a, I'm not wishing that on anybody, and I don't want to say I want to go early, but there's nothing the earth can do to you. They can't steal your joy. They cannot steal your joy. You were not made for this earth. You know that? Back when I was a kid, we had this guy who came in, and he was singing a song. And I'm not going to sing. Praise God, everybody just said, right? Um, but he would say, he says, I'm an alien. I drive a Pinto wherever I go. You know, I, 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 I forgot the words now. But anyways, he's talking about this whole idea of being an alien. And it was from the scripture where he says, you're not made from this earth. Your joy comes, your joy, the Bible says, is unspeakable. And it's full of glory. You're an, you're an alien to this earth. This is not your home. You're here temporarily. But your home, if you're a Christian, is going to be eternally with jesus and the book of revelation it says that we're going to worship god day in and day out come on with that what more could you want i expect a little more amen out of that one but mel needs some joy up in here huh hey we'll get the worship team to come up and sing i got the joy yeah <laughs> y'all remember that oh yeah i'm showing my age now 
You were not made for this earth. Your joy, the Bible says, is unspeakable, is full glory. Do you have joy or are you just happy? It's not wrong to be happy. It's okay to be happy. But I'm more interested in you guys having joy. So I think, I think if Jacob was here, i got three more things real quick and we're going to wrap this up. I think if Jacob was here in his robes and everything, and you know, as you would picture, picture him, I think he would give us three encouraging things. You ready? First off, brokenness precedes breakthrough. Brokenness precedes breakthrough. Nothing can happen until you give in. You cannot experience the joy that God has for you until you surrender it all to Him. The truth is that a pastor's job is to help people better understand the nature of God. And I, and I think at Man, I think we do a really good job at it. I think we do really good, especially with Tom. Tom is fantastic at it. Uh, I love the phrase that I've kind of adopted in my own language. He says, you're made on purpose and for a purpose, right? God is, he's created you on purpose and it's for a purpose. And I've also heard him say, and we've talked about this because uh, we both came from that same era, but, uh, well, actually, I'm not the same era, but I'm a little bit behind him anyways. Anyways, he says, you know, uh, um, God is not mad at you. Too many of us walk around here and we're thinking, well, I just ticked off God. You know, he's, now he's mad at me. I don't want to go talk to him. He's going to thump me in the head and call me an idiot, backhand me. That's what we're used to. God's mad at me. Do not, hear my words, if you walk out of here with anything, walk out of here with, you got to have joy, and this phrase, do not confuse God's greatness and God's love, unconditional love at that. Do not confuse them with that of the love of your parents, loved ones, friends, family. He does not compare at all. He is much, much bigger than that. You do not serve a God that is mostly mad. You do not. Matter of fact, I've had people say, well, you know, I ask them, hey, do you want to, you know, I go through the whole salvation plan with them. I say, you ready to make that step and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? I am, but not right now. Whoa, I'm like, what? What are, you, what are you waiting for? Well, I have to go get a couple things right in my life. Dude, I'll be waiting here the rest of my life because you're never going to do it. Well, I don't want God to know. I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to bring all this baggage with me. Time out. Can we, just, can we just agree that God is bigger than your baggage? Can we agree that God created you and He's going to accept you for who you are? How about we just do it this way? Let's get real theological here. God already knows your baggage. <laughs> you can't hide it from Him. And you know what? Let's go a little bit deeper. He's the only one that can take that baggage from you. So quit waiting. I know this isn't for you guys. This is for the second service. I'm warming up for the second service. God is not, we don't serve a God that is mostly mad, he is mostly glad. And, and, and I want to say he's loving, but loving doesn't rhyme with mad, so he's mostly glad, okay? And pastor, we always have to make things rhyme, we always got to start with the same letter, you know, it's, it's, they don't even teach us that in school. All you have to do is give him a chance, give him control of your life. Is it scary? Heck yeah! Am I going to be perfect? Heck No! <laughs> And you have permission not to be perfect. Is it worth it? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. I don't know where I would be if I didn't plug into God, if I didn't have mentors over me and, and people praying me through things. The number one fan is my wife. Praying me through things. Now, Vince, that's not your path. You need to get back to God. Matter of fact, David in Psalms, writing to writing about God or into God and he writes this in Psalm 51, and if you don't have this, memorize this psalm. Memorize this psalm, apply it to your life. One simple verse, the sacrifice you desire, God, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. So if you're here, you're listening online, you're here today, and you, have a, you feel like you're broken, you feel like your sin is just too big, that's exactly what God is looking for. That's exactly what He's looking for. For. And all you have to do is be humble enough to come to him and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, but I was saved by grace. I need you to fix my baggage. Matter of fact, in 1 Peter 5, 5-6, it says, In the same way, you younger men must accept authority of, uh, of the elders. And all of you serve each other in humility, for God opposes. You never want the word opposes next to your name, right? Uh, the proud, but he favors the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. 
You see, it's not about you. But Jesus and God make it all about you. You surrendering your life and giving God full control of your life, he's like, I got it, Kyle. Now I'm going to make it all about you. Now I'm going to elevate you. It's like, wow, what kind of, this math doesn't work. (laughs) It doesn't work, but for God, it does. God is not looking for perfection. Amen. Right? He's not looking, you do not have to be perfect. That right there just took a whole load off of me. Whoo! Do not have to be perfect. He's looking for progression. He just wants you to be honest and humble. Second thing Jacob would tell us is that you must lose yourself in order to find yourself. That sounds like some kind of, I don't know, some weird maze stuff. I don't know. But look at Mark 8, 34. Then Jesus, this is Jesus talking. He says, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. That whole thing of trying to live your life the way you want to live it, not giving God control, that's what we're talking about. Turn from your selfish ways. And in, in, one, in one rendition, in one version, it says, and let me lead you. Take up your cross, let me lead you, and you follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to, go to verse 35, he says, if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. If you try and do it your way, Edith, it's not going to work. Don't do it. You're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, if you let me have full control, God says, if you let me have full control of your life, and you you, you give up your life for my sake and the sake of the good news of the gospel, you will save it. There's nothing you can do, there's nothing the earth can do to you that's going to hurt you. We already talked about that. So get in the game. Get in the game. That's what this means. Pick up your cross. Lose your, lose your, your life. Get, let God have control of you. What does that look like? Uh, get in the game. We have small groups. We have growth track. Matter of fact, I heard one pastor say, I'm going to give you the one-year challenge. I don't think we need that here. I, I think you could do it in six months because we're, we're an awesome church. And I'm not saying that because I'm on staff here. I'm saying it because I love the way manna does things. And I'm not the only one. I can show you guest card after guest card after guest card for the year and a half I've been here. People just say, you guys preach what you, you guys practice what you preach. We love the feeling. We love it. I can tell you time and time again. It's not just my words, okay? Not, and Tom didn't tell me to say this. But I can tell you, we can do this in six months. If you commit six months serving on a serve team, go through growth track, uh, get in a small group, get behind the, the production team, get on the worship team, do something. Get in the game and see if God doesn't do something with you, okay? And you know what? You don't even have to do it here because I know we have people up in New York, we've got people in Romania, we've got people all around the world. Get in a Bible-believing church that has a vision to change the world, and I guarantee you will not be the same in six months. Matter of fact, if you are, go to another church, because there's something wrong, all right? (laughs) We're not doing our jobs. Okay, don't allow, do not allow what you think you want to get in the way of whom God made you to be. Did y'all get that? Don't allow what you think you want. I think I want to be an, aer- an, uh, uh, an airplane pilot. I've always wanted to fly. Still haven't. But I don't want that to get in the way of God, who, who God actually created me to be. I need to follow that. Third thing that, that um, Paul would tell us, and I want to close with this, because this is really kind of a prayer, is when you find yourself in God's, on God's terms, when you find yourself on God's terms, you will find fulfillment. There's too many people that are sitting on the couch, and I'm just, this is the way I look at it. They just sit on the couch, and they're waiting for that big check in the mail. They're waiting for someone to knock on their door to offer them the most optimal job. They're sitting there waiting for God to show up, and God's sitting there. It's like, I'm just waiting for you to get up off the couch. (laughs) Do this on my terms, and I guarantee you'll be fulfilled. This is God saying, not me. So what I want to do is, uh, as, you're, as, you're, as you're wrapping up your notes, you got those two in there, terms, um, and you find yourself in God's terms, and you find fulfillment, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to, I want you to put your notes away. There's nothing else to write. I just want you to hear this, this verses. And I want, to, I want to close out in this prayer. We're going to go to Romans 12, 1 through 2. It's on the screen. I'm reading from the message because it talks in like everyday language. Paul writing to the, the, the church in Rome, in Rome. He says, so here's what I want you to do. 
God helping you, I want you to take your ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Ladies and gentlemen, what this means is that you got two rooms. You got this big room right here. It's full of all your stuff. All of it, everything. Your anxieties, your your depression, your 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 happiness, if you will. Your kids, your spouse, your addictions, everything is in this room. Your finances, your career, everything's in this room. And then you got this room. It's not even a room, it's just a big uh, I'm trying to paint it as, a, as a, a platform, a big altar, like you would see, on, like, a, like someone's going to make a sacrifice on something. It's a big, huge altar. And it's big enough. So, and what God wants you to do is take each thing, your anxiety, and put it on this. There, Lord, I give that to you. Here, here, here's my finances. That one we really have a hard time giving away, huh? Okay, that one's yours. Oh, here's my kids. I've wanted to give these to you for a while now, but you're, you know, here, they're yours now, you know? And I don't mean give them away, but. Lord, those kids are just for me to maintain. You created them on purpose and for a purpose. Oh, hey, Lord, here's my wife, my spouse, my wife, because I'm married. She's my wife. Put her on there. Lord, I surrender her to you. Whatever you're going to do in her, let me be part of it, but she's yours too. You see, this is what Paul is saying. Take everything until this room is empty. Empty. There should be nothing left in it except air. Take everything out of this room and get it on that altar as a sacrifice to God. Lord, I give you everything. I am nothing without you. I give you all of it. Paul goes on to say, embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Come on, if you're a parent, you know this is true. There's just so much truth in that one little verse, in that one little piece. If you just do what I told you, right? Right? How many times you say that if you just told, if I just did what I told you, you wouldn't be in this mess. But you're still there to love them. He goes on to say, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. When your mind is not focused on God, you'll flow in a river that takes you wherever society wants you to take it. And you find yourself so far away from him. He said, instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. There's where that joy comes from be changed from the inside out readily recognize that he god wants from you what he wants from you and quickly respond to it do you know that when you focus on god you can hear him better i'm deaf okay i wear hearing aids but it's so much easier when i look at someone and i and they're talking i can't read lips but it helps me hear them try it a man, we have selective hearing, right? We go in the other room. My wife's like, hum, hum, hum. no, honey, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. But if I focus on God, if I look at God's face and I say, Father, what do you want from me? His voice becomes so apparent to me. And once it becomes so apparent, it's almost you. He builds his voice, builds you the confidence to go and do what he's called you to do because you know it's his voice. It's like dad told me to do this. I have to do this. Unlike the culture around you, uh, he wants you to respond to what he's telling you. Unlike the culture around you, who's dragging you down into its, to its level of immaturity. God brings out the best in you and develops a well-formed maturity in you. I love the way Paul put this together. The way, the way this is written. Man, this is so impactful. I encourage you to go back and reread this. Pray it back to God. And here's my closing thought for you. You will never know. You will never know what your life could become. You'll never know what your life could become until you hand it over to the one who created it. You just won't. You can fight and argue and wrestle with God all you want. It's going to mean nothing except you're going to be tired, you're going to be burnt out, you're going to get angry at God, you're going to try and blame Him. He's like, you're right, you're right, okay. Now you want to do it my way? (laughs) You'll never know what your life could become, what your life could become until you hand it over to the one who created it. So commit yourself today.
to surrender it all to Christ. Surrender your life to God. Pursue everything He has for you with a new strength, a polished identity, and with this internal joy that you can't get rid of. Amen? Would you stand so I can pray with you? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you so much. And Father, I know when I say that, I say it from almost a human perspective. But you said in your word that you love me so much that you sent your son to die for me. So Father, if you're willing to send your son, you were willing and you did send your son to die for me. Lord, I surrender everything I have for you today. And Lord, I'm just praying this out loud and maybe it's somebody listening right now. I know there's people who are wrestling with you right now who don't know how to say what's on their heart. They don't know what, to, how to, what the next step is. Father, it's a verbal recognition that you are Lord and King. And Father, I just, I'm saying the words that I know I have repeated many times in my life because I've gotten off track, made mistakes. But Father, you are full of grace. You're full of mercy. And you saw me as I could be, not as, as I actually was. I was fallen from grace. I was lost. And you found me. You rescued me. And Father, you did not only just rescue me, but you, you gave me an upgrade and you used me. You called me your prince. You called me your favorite kid. And Father, I know there's people here today that maybe they feel a little lost. They feel a little off track. Maybe they've lost their joy. They thought they lost their joy. They're trying to stay on a, on a ventilation system of happiness. Father, I pray that the, the happiness would turn to joy. They would find you and that their joy would be restored. Our joy is found in you. Father, I pray that you would become our, our guide, our conscience. Holy Spirit, just fill us anew. For every Christian that's listening, the Holy Spirit is in you. Ask Him. Tell Him, I need this joy. I need joy in my life. And watch what He does to you. And Father, lastly, I just pray that we would surrender everything we have, put it on the altar before you. Lord, we empty ourselves so we can be used by you. Father, you have a plan, and it's a perfect plan for our lives. You've guided all of our steps. You know what's going to make us successful. So, Father, I'm praying that you would be the yoke. You'd be in the other half of the yoke with us so we can draw the perfect lines and we can get the work done in half the time. Father, I just love you so much. And Father, I just, I want to, I want to pray for those right now that maybe they're, they're listening and they're like, well, Vince, I just, I don't know what this God is that you're talking about. I don't know about this joy that you're talking about. And if that's you here today, we're not going to embarrass you. And if you're online, just, just hang with me for one more moment, for one more prayer. Because I never want to, I never want to end a sermon without giving someone the chance to have this life altering decision. You may say, well, it's just a little prayer, but yes, it echoes eternity. Your yes will echo in eternity. It may not change the home you go home to this afternoon, but it will change the home you go to after you die. And my heart is to believe more for you than you believe for yourself. And I want to believe that when you die, your next face you're going to see is Jesus. And as a pastor, as a friend, as a brother, as a as a, as a companion and, and, and as a brother in Christ, I want to be able to see you in heaven. So if that's you here today, and I would just invite you to say this prayer. You don't have to, you don't have to you know, make a big deal out of it. Just everybody, if we could just repeat this prayer together. And people online, if you're listening, just pray it. And if you've committed your life, I'll give you some instructions afterwards. So just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, thank you that you died on the cross for my sin. I've sinned against God, and I am sorry. I repent, and I need your forgiveness. Come into my heart, and be Lord over my life. From this moment forward, I want to follow you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here today and you made that commitment, there's a couple things you can do. We'll have, there will be some people in the back on the, the tables. You can talk to them. There's a little booklet in the back of your chair called Raise My Hand. Uh, if you're online, 
please shoot us a message. Let us know you, you committed your life to Christ and we will reach out to you. It's awesome. God is a great God. He is the great provider. And I don't want you to leave here thinking anything other than that. He has a plan for your life. All you have to do is surrender to him. So would you raise your hands and let me bless you before you leave. I want to pray that the Lord would keep you and he would guide you. I want to pray that he would delight in you. May his face shine upon you. May you see his face, understand his voice, hear his voice. May he grant you his peace. Remember, you were made on purpose and for a purpose, and you are God's favorite kid. He will direct your steps if you give him control. And now in the name of Jesus, go and change the world. Amen. Be blessed. Until next time. <clears throat> Thank you, man.